Are you maybe in a basement playing guitar, recording in your buddy's place, and you're thinking to yourself, how do I make my guitar sound better? What do I do to get to that next level? That's a question I've been getting asked over and over and over. I'm gonna give you six ways that you can level up your guitar playing in a recording studio. Number one, and there's a reason why I'm holding this robot guitar that tunes itself. Tune yourself and be intonated. For those that don't know what intonated means, I can play an E down here and I can play an E up here and it's all in tune and this is all adjusted so that no matter where I play around the neck is perfectly in tune. Because sometimes you can play cowboy chords and then all of a sudden you're playing chords up here and it sounds weird and funky. That's because you're not intonated. If you go and work with almost any top producer in the studio, you're gonna hear something constantly. Check your tuning, check your tuning, check your tuning. Tune your guitar in between takes. Tune your guitar when you put your guitar down. There is nothing worse than when you're recording a song. You got the drums, you're like 20 tracks in, and all of a sudden you start laying down some more guitars, maybe some vocals, some bass, and something sounds terrible. Why do I feel like I'm going to puke? Oh, that's right. That's because track number 17, the guitars are going completely sharp and then they're going completely flat by the time they hit the G. When you start stacking all these layers, you know, some tracks, you can have 50, 100 tracks. If you're not in tune, it's not a cool thing. It's not, hey, rock and roll, baby, tuned enough for funk. It's gonna make people feel weird. I have a strobe tuner hooked up through the output of my amp switcher so that at all times I can just go. Sounds out of tune to me. Do you know how many tracks I've gotten from bands? And I'm like, well, that's viciously out of tune. And yes, a lot of the times it's the G string. If you want to sound like a professional guitarist, you want to make your recordings better, get a tuner, have it next to you at all times and assume that when you're digging in, you're going sharp or flat, something's happening. You might have really stable, stable tuning, but I find being in the studio when you're playing your heart out, you're sweating, you're going for it. Got a great take, tune that. Now, please guys, hang out until we get to number six, because number six for me is probably the most important thing to get your playing to the next level. We'll get there soon, but number two, this one is deep in my heart. Be able to play to a click track. You know, a metronome, something you can download on your phone for free that goes tick, tick, tick. You may feel that you have perfect feel. I would bet my bottom dollar that you're not playing a four and a half minute song off the top of your head from start to finish perfectly to a click. That doesn't matter. Yeah, it does. Anybody that has really, really good timing can play to a click when you actually know what measure you are in the song because you've done it to a grid, whether you fixed it to a grid, that's a very different thing. But when you've played to a grid, you know where everything is. So you can send it to other people, have people layer things on top. And then if it sounds weird and messed up, you can be like, oh, look at that. The bass player's way behind the beat because you played to a click track. Dude, I sound great, I'm fine. Then you turn on. Well, now I know why my wife was bobbing while I was weaving because I had no rhythm. I'm not about editing myself to sound perfect. I'm not about studio magic. I'm about playing it right and then using techniques to make it sound better. And when you play to a click, and when you have everybody else play to a click, your music will feel better. And do not conflate that with fixing everything to a click, because you can still play to a click and be terrible, but at least you know why you're terrible. Three, as in the gym and three. Play for the song. If you're playing a cover of When I Come Around by Green Day, you don't need Jeff Loomis to come in and start doing sweet picking. There has been such a focus on this hyper technique. Like, go and listen to songs you've listened to all of your life and just pay attention to the guitars. You don't always have Randy Rhodes whittly whittlies in the middle of songs. Being able to play good rhythm and to just fill the space with great sounds. Perfect example, Brian May from Queen. He's an incredible player. He can solo his brains out, but sometimes it's just a din 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 din. Nice little arpeggio, a rake. 
just a held out thing, because that's what the song needs. Becoming a great guitarist is knowing when to pull out the pyro and when just to play and uphold the song. Listen to a guy like David Gilmour. Pink Floyd has super simple guitars. The solos are simple, the playing is simple, and guess what? It's freaking perfect. Learn how to write parts that make the bass better, that accentuate the snare drum or the kick drum, where you actually listen to the other members of the band and say, hey, what can I do with this thing to make your guy's job easier? That's a great guitarist. More is more. That's true for Ingbe Malmsteen. That's not true for most people. I'm outside mowing my lawn to Elton John, not Ingve. Which brings me on to number four. Learn how to layer your guitar in the studio. My favorite basic technique is called doubling. It just means you record one part and then you play that exact same part, maybe with a different pickup, different amp, a different microphone, and you pan it hard right and hard left. It creates this stereo effect. And if you play tight enough to yourself, maybe you're playing to a click track, you can make your guitar sound huge just by playing the same thing. One of the reasons Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses is one of the greatest records of all time is because Slash and Izzy, they're doing what you could do by yourself in the studio. They're layering. Their ability to kind of hop back and forth and play slightly different parts out of each ear, but then to make it sounds symbiotic like it's supposed to go together where now you just got this deep dirty groove going on band like Aerosmith you listen to Joe Perry and Brad Whitford together even with a little bit of Tom Hamilton on bass those guys are all playing different things and even if you solo the track sometime you're like well, I guess Joe Perry was on cocaine wow that's walk this way knowing in your mind where to map out this is where I come in with the distortion I want to put a harmony on this Knowing how to layer your stuff in the studio to make things sound huge, but also to complement the song is super important. Five, melody is everything. If you can't hum it, there's a very distinct possibility that no one will ever remember it after they listen to it. Da -na 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 and you got me feeling all right. Just goes to show that I don't know the lyrics to anything, but I know the melodies to everything. If you can hum it, it will stay in your memory. Why do you think that all these songs have like the wanna na na, wanna na na, hey, 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 goodbye. It's the catchiest thing in the world, melody. If you have a good melody, if you have something that sticks out in your mind, a little earworm, that is so much more impactful than a thousand notes. I am not dissing the Yngwie's, the extreme metal bands out there. That's great. I'm saying that when a whole audience of 90,000 people can hum to what you're doing, it's gonna be more memorable. And I can to say, there's a distinct possibility that it will also be way freaking better. I'll go back to Mr. David Gilmore. Watch any Pink Floyd live album. Everyone in the audience, they're playing air guitar or they're humming along because his guitar solos are so iconic, so melodic, so perfectly written that they become like vocal melodies that everybody knows. I can literally hum you the solo to comfortably numb note for note. Are you trying to write timeless songs that other people are going to love or are you just writing what's in your heart and that's black metal? There's nothing wrong with any of that. But if you wanna level up your guitar playing, if you wanna be in a band and have people respect you, the more melodic you play, the more understanding of melody, the more ways that you can understand how to uphold a vocal melody with your guitar playing, the better of a guitar player you shall be. That's just a fact. It's one thing to be able to play for a minute or two minutes online and have these super shred techniques, but then never have been able to play knocking on heaven's door or just jam with your friends. All you did was sit at home watching Paul Gilbert's video and practicing your alternate picking instead of focusing on, well, how do I actually write a good song? How do I become somebody in the studio that's valuable? Focus on playing things with melody that people want to hear again and again and again. You've made it to number six 
the most important thing to leveling up your playing. Go play with real people. My recommendation is find a great drummer. I can't tell you how much I appreciate my buddy Paul, the drummer in Lost Symphony. You've seen him on this channel a bunch of times. Paul, for the last 17 years, has made me a better player. He's been my human metronome, because it's one thing to practice to a click track, it's another thing to practice to a drummer, but most importantly, it's even better to practice to a drummer who's practiced to a click track, because then they're keeping up the click track, and then all you need to do is follow a solid drummer. I will say it's a double-edged sword because if you get a poopy drummer, they'll be doing you a disservice. Look at Metallica. You wanna know why they sound so freaking tight? James Hetfield. His right hand is amazing. And even when Lars completely, completely messes up, James Hetfield somehow is able to make it sound like they're playing tight. He's so good, he compensates for his boy Lars. Let me just go on record as saying, he's freaking brilliant. He wrote some of the greatest drum parts ever. And when he's on, he's on. I've seen Metallica 22 times. The only thing that's never been off when I've seen them has been this right hand of James Hetfield holding his pick with three. Find yourself people to jam with. I just went down to Florida and worked on a bunch of tunes with my buddy Shannon Larkin, the drummer of Godsmack. I left with an education. I have pretty good rhythm, but a lot of the things that he does are not natural to my right hand. So he's like, Benny, it's da 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 He's giving me all these faces and he's like, stand up like this. He's like, now, now go on like that. Cause I wasn't feeling it. Shannon, another human being in a room playing music with me after 41 years, taught my right hand and my mind all kinds of new rhythmic ideas. Playing with other people will teach you new things. And you hopefully in turn can teach them new things. Shannon's showing this dude with no rhythm how to do some rhythm, and I'm showing him chords. I'm explaining triads. We're two human beings in a room playing with one another. If you do those six things, stay in tune, play to a click track, play to the song, know how to layer yourself, play with melody, and then surround yourself with better musicians that keep you in line and help you learn. You will get better and I can't wait to hear about it. Why don't you smash that subscribe button already?